This video is brought to you by Squarespace, the best all-in-one platform to build beautiful sites for any and all of your needs, from portfolios to online stores. Hey guys, it's Celestia, and today we're gonna be talking about TikTok, because who isn't talking about TikTok in the year 2022? Specifically though, we're gonna be talking about TikTok's art community, and why it is, in my opinion, and that of many others, such a toxic, hostile, unwelcoming environment for artists, and for people in general. There are quite a few primary reasons that I'll be getting into, because TikTok is a very unique case in that its art community is not necessarily more toxic than that of other platforms like Twitter. It's just toxic in an entirely new, different, unique way. I'm not saying it's all bad or that no one should use it. I'm almost never saying that about anything I criticize except maybe those old how to draw manga books. It's got both good and bad, and it's just like any other art community in that toxicity will be a part of any large group of people because people suck, and having a lot of them in one place means conflict. But the way that toxicity has been nurtured and cultivated by the nature of the platform is, to me, significant, and I want to talk about it. But first, let me take a moment to talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace is a website building and hosting tool that lets you create anything from a beautiful portfolio to a versatile online store. And as you guys might recall from another of my recent videos, I've been using it long before this sponsorship to make and run the site for my art studio, Royal Starship Studios. As you can see from looking at that site, the gallery features that Squarespace offers are perfect for portfolios, and the automatic image scaling means you can easily add and showcase art from any and all types of projects. But what I've been even more interested in lately is their e-commerce integration. I've already been selling my general art on merch for years now, but as my channel has grown, I've started considering making some actual Duchess Celestia branded merch too. And given how easy Squarespace makes it to use print on demand to add an online store to your site, I'm now working on switching my primary portfolio and website over and adding a proper Celestia merch store to it. And they've got so many templates and tools that making that switch isn't even hard. It's actually kind of fun messing around and creating a fancy new site. Anyway, thank Thank you so much to Squarespace for sponsoring this video, and please go check out squarespace.com to get a free trial to build your website, be it a portfolio for your art or a store to sell it on, or both. And once you've built it, go to squarespace.com slash duchesscelestia to save 10% on your first website or domain purchase. Now, all that aside, let's get into the video. And before all you TikTok fans out there start preparing to kick my ass for daring to suggest that it may happen to ever so slightly suck, I want to make it abundantly clear that I'm not saying TikTok is bad, or that the TikTok art community is all bad, at least not necessarily more so than any other platform or art community. I'm not saying I hate it or that you should hate it. I use TikTok, although mostly only to consume content and not post it, for reasons I'll get into more later. And for the most part, I enjoy using it. There are just a few very glaringly large problems that I've noticed in the process of enjoying it that I wanted to discuss today. Because not only are they problems that should be brought up, they're problems that are weirdly unique to TikTok. And in my opinion, that's in large part because TikTok is, in many ways, a very different and almost sequestered community compared to other social media platforms. Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter are largely considered to be the big three of social media, the pillars of online networking that most people have and check simultaneously. Checking social media tends to be synonymous with checking all three, without any huge significance being placed on anyone in particular, with some exceptions based on the individual. Therefore, the communities built within all three tend to have a lot of overlap, and while there are notable sociological differences between them, like Facebook being more family and friend oriented and Twitter being more drama fueled, there are no different is so large that a user of one would find themselves feeling culture shock when logging into one of the others. And when they want content that the big three aren't tailored to, they'll branch out. They go to YouTube for videos, Twitch for streams, others for news, and so on. But in many ways, TikTok has actually filled all of those roles for its users. Many of them use it as their primary social media platform, replacing or at least overshadowing the previous big three, while also using it as their primary source of video content, live streams, and even news. So while the president of TikTok calls it an entertainment platform rather than than a social media platform, I don't believe that that's functionally true. The biggest appeal of TikTok is, to many, that it basically combines everything they love about social media with everything they love about video-based entertainment platforms, making it more of an all-in-one package of both than anything else. And because of that, the culture on the app is entirely different than either. Many people who use the big three of social media and the big two of video streaming exclusively find themselves shocked and overwhelmed by those differences when trying out TikTok, largely due to how toxic, reactionary, aggressive, and fast-paced it is. And when Twitter users are surprised at the toxicity of another platform, you know something wild as hell is going on there. They're from Twitter. For them to find something too toxic is like a fish finding something too wet. But as a result of that, a lot of people either find TikTok too polarizing and choose to avoid it, or love it and prioritize it as their primary social media platform, which contributes to something of a divide between the communities of TikTok and other forms of social media. That divide is only worsened by the generational gap, as it's primarily used by a Gen Z audience, 
while millennials and older generations tend to stick with the older social media platforms that they're already familiar with. Not only that, but the content itself separates the platform from others. Yes, TikTok makes it very easy for anyone to create content with very straightforward and user-friendly editing tools, but making content that actually gets the attention of an audience is uniquely difficult there. For example, as a content creator whose primary form of content is usually either still images or long-form high-effort video content, it's very, very hard for me to translate that content to TikTok, where the focus is exclusively on video that's less than 60 seconds. In order to cater to a user base that is notorious for short attention spans and get their attention within the first few seconds of a video well enough to keep it, I would have to start creating an entirely new type of content just for that platform alone, which is why I've personally stopped posting there. I just don't have the time. When I used to work my marketing job, I ran the social media team, and while all other platforms our organization used were run by general social media coordinators, we actually had a specific manager for TikTok alone that focused on only that platform, simply because it was so different from other platforms that effectively marketing on it required an entirely different skill set and type of knowledge and experience. For better or for worse, because of its focus on short-form video content as well as its combination of entertainment with social media, TikTok is like nothing we've ever seen before in terms of social media in pretty much every way, both in terms of content and community. And that's no different for its art community. The things that make it so uniquely toxic as a result usually fall into the category of art-based problems or community-based problems. So with that ridiculously long preamble aside, let's talk about both, starting with the art side, moving on to the community side, and then concluding with an example of both coalescing into an awful, traumatic shit show for a young artist on the platform. So looking at TikTok's art community, it actually looks pretty helpful and handy on the surface. It's full of people sharing their processes, tutorials, and tips, and I've personally found a lot of really helpful art hacks on there, mostly pertaining to Procreate shortcuts and hidden features. Like I said, and will not stop saying, TikTok's art community is not all bad, and a lot of the content on there is valuable and constructive. But just like almost every other problem I'm gonna address throughout this video, it's the short form nature of the content that makes this harmless, positive content such a problem. See, a large part of the art content on TikTok markets itself as being educational. It looks like it's a reliable resource for learning, like the creators making these videos know what they're talking about and can be trusted to communicate accurate and correct information. But if you only have 60 seconds to convey an idea, how well can you actually teach an aspect of art? Poorly. Poorly is the answer, almost all of the time. When I reached out on Twitter and asked you guys what you thought about the art community on TikTok, the answer I got most was hands down, the art tutorials are so goddamn bad. And I, yeah, yeah, they sure are. That was one of the first things I thought of too. And in some cases, it's because of the prevalent problem there that is beginner artists making tutorials without being anywhere near qualified enough to be teaching anything about art based on their own knowledge of it. Yes. But in many, many other cases, it's not that the artist making the tutorials doesn't know their shit or is technically wrong about what they're saying. It's that they simply do not have enough time to communicate the necessary complexity of the points that they're making. For example, a TikTok could tell you to use certain color combinations in your pieces, but it wouldn't have time to explain why, based on color theory, you should be using those combinations. So you would learn the color combinations for very specific situations, but you wouldn't learn anything about color theory or how to combine those colors yourself in future instances. Or Conversely, a TikTok could show you an example of how to draw a hand right and how to draw one wrong, but it couldn't explain why the right way is right or the wrong way is wrong. It's kind of like TikTok art tutorials give you a fish instead of teaching you how to fish. And this isn't inherently harmful, but it's also not inherently educational either. That said, it can be harmful in different circumstances, because really, that's just the best case example. There's also no shortage of examples of educational art content on TikTok that ends up spreading incomplete or outright incorrect art advice simply because of the time constraint. For example, since TikTok art tutorials aren't much different than those annoying one image art hacks on Pinterest and Instagram where they draw one thing right and one thing wrong and then give no further information, let's look at this one. They say the palm on the left is right and the palm on the right is wrong. And if the subject they're drawing isn't double jointed or is particularly stiff or they're trying to convey a looser pose, the artist who made this is correct. But I personally can comfortably bend my wrist much farther than that because I'm double jointed. And by neglecting context and not saying this is only applicable in certain circumstances, or this is why it's applicable in this circumstance, the artist that made this tutorial is basically saying that my wrist is wrong or doesn't exist, and is teaching young artists to never draw wrists that way. TikTok art hacks are fundamentally the same, and in that regard, they can be detrimental to the education of young artists still learning how to draw, because while they're not necessarily flat out wrong, the way they're saying to draw right is really only applicable in certain circumstances and for certain reasons, and saying or implying that they're always applicable might end up teaching artists incorrect information and hindering their education and growth. And a lot of the people making this content 
student might not even realize the harm in that because they might not consider that what they're not teaching by conforming to that short form video time limit is just as significant as what they are teaching, if not more so. Like, for example, teaching artists that shading with black washes out some color palettes without teaching them that there are other instances, like in traditional comic styles, where it can increase dynamic values when done right, is basically the same as teaching them that you should never shade with black, even if that isn't what they were meaning to communicate. And with such a short, limited time frame to teach them in, that's often inevitable, resulting in a huge problem within TikTok's art community, because content that's marketed as educational is either significantly less so than it seems, or is even outright incorrect as a result of the relevant context and complexity being sacrificed. All of this is just based on artists trying to convey complex points within the confines of TikTok's very short time limit, though. We also have to consider that based on the increasingly short attention spans of the platform's users, it's more than likely that even if artists could share enough information for their content to be properly educational and accurate, audiences wouldn't be interested enough to watch it. People like these super simple, straightforward, learn art in one minute hacks. They're not interested in sitting through a 15 minute explanation of why those art hacks work. Art education has to be quick, snappy, easy, and oftentimes promising dramatic improvement for many on TikTok to be interested in it at all. And unfortunately, that means it's really not gonna be that educational. But that's just the tutorial side, which is only the tip of the iceberg when it comes to the problems with the art-focused side of TikTok's art community. There's also the equally significant and even more alarming issue of the prominence of trends. Trends are the backbone of TikTok. They're what keep users not only engaging regularly and constantly with the content of others, but what encourages them to contribute their own content to it and keep the platform booming as it always seems to be. Trends are also one of the most widely criticized aspects of TikTok, and for good reason. They're frequently known to encourage their statistically very young users to engage in risky, dangerous behaviors because everyone else that's doing it is getting likes. It's a problem that is much worse, larger, and wider reaching than what I'll be discussing today. But suffice it to say that the platform itself, rather than trying to address the issue, is promoting it and encouraging it. And in fairness, the art community, compared to other communities on TikTok, does not actually deal with the dark side of trends nearly as often or as harmfully. The trends followed within it don't often put people in any actual physical danger. But that doesn't mean they're harmless, because more often than not, art community trends on TikTok are based on mocking the art of beginner artists that the masses have deemed bad. This can quickly turn into outright harassment and bullying, where hundreds, thousands, or even tens of thousands of users will dogpile an artist just for having art that isn't up to their standards. And because of just how socially acceptable following trends without question is on TikTok, no one gives it a second thought. It's just a joke, right? Everyone else is laughing and joking along, and you've seen 800 people duet the same video of a beginner artist drawing poorly with vitriolic and hateful mockery. It seems harmless and redundant to make that 801. The prevalence of trend following has also led to as much art fixing as Twitter, if not more, in which cases people feel like they have the authority to duet an artist process video with a fixed, correct version of their own. Sometimes this is based on social issues, like whitewashing or body shaming, which is its own can of worms to open another day. But a lot of it is just artists seeing technical errors in the work of others and deciding it's their place to correct them. And that brings me to the final major problem with the art side of TikTok's art community, the unsolicited criticism. For reasons I'll get into more in the community section, people on TikTok seem to be unnaturally and abundantly comfortable being cruel to strangers without any acknowledgement of the fact that these are real people. And amongst other things, this has led to it becoming a community standard for people to comment criticisms on other people's art posts without ever being asked to, often even when that person has openly stated that they're not open to critique. Unsolicited critique is its own issue that I plan on discussing in its own video soon, but the TLDR summary of my opinion on it is that if an artist doesn't ask for critique, you shouldn't give it. You might think it's helpful, you might mean the best, but you don't know what that artist's goals are. They might not be trying to improve, so critique to help them improve is both unwanted and unnecessary. Or they might be particularly sensitive or insecure, in which case critique might do more harm than good or even prompt them to stop drawing. I know being in an echo chamber of exclusively positivity isn't conducive to an artist's growth, and honest, constructive criticism is both necessary and deeply beneficial for any artist looking to improve. But not all artists are looking to improve, and not all artists are ready for that. So assuming that your input is both wanted and helpful is just incorrect, and maybe more hurtful than it ever will be useful. And on most platforms, for those reasons and more, giving unsolicited critique is widely regarded as a shitty thing to do. I mean, it still happens, but it's still regarded that way by most people. But on TikTok, it's just, it's just a normal thing over there to look at a stranger's work and blatantly comment everything you think is wrong with it, which is just, it's a surreal and kind of upsetting thing to witness, honestly, because 90% of it isn't even constructive in the slightest. I'll show some screenshots on screen right now of a handful of the comments I saw after a very brief look at the community so that you guys can see for yourselves. But the vast majority is just vicious, unsolicited hate. One person actually blamed an artist 
artist that was being bullied because as they said, if the artist wasn't gonna fix what was wrong with their art, the way they're being treated is their own fault. Prior to researching this video, I avoided posting on TikTok because I didn't have time to make content exclusively for the platform. Now, after seeing everything I've seen, I'm avoiding posting because I'm appalled and disgusted by the culture of hate and animosity that's fostered there and I don't want to be anywhere near it. In fairness, comments like the ones I showed you are matched twofold by comments that are supportive and kind or calling out the people that are spreading hate and unsolicited, non-constructive criticism. But it doesn't change that at least in my experience, the toxicity is so much more prevalent and normalized than on any other art community I've ever been in. And I used to be on Amino. I'm still on Twitter. And I can't stomach TikTok. I think that says something. But all of that aside, let's move on to the next section. The community side of art TikTok and the problems that the sensationalized short form nature of the platform creates. The first criticism that's often levied against TikTok, no matter the community, is that it's widely regarded as the most toxic, extreme, reactionary, zero to a hundred, cancel culture riddled social media platform out there. And that's a criticism that I struggle to refute, honestly. But why is it that way? And is it really so much worse than its competitors? Well, let me tell you. Let me tell you my theories at least, because all of this is really just an educated guess on my part. As I've already mentioned multiple times, the short form content that makes TikTok so popular is also the source of the majority of its issues, at least in my opinion. It's also, in my opinion, the source of the toxicity that the platform is known for, in combination with the algorithm-based nature of engagement. And bear with me because explaining what I mean is gonna be, well, exactly the kind of long-winded rambling that's basically my brand at this point. People argue that Twitter is also short-form content because of the character limit, and that TikTok is no more toxic as a result of that than Twitter is. People also argue that YouTube is just as inclined towards cancel culture as TikTok, based on the number of videos that will come out about a drama only hours after the details of it have been made public. Technically, they're both right, but there are flaws with both arguments resulting from the failure to consider context. Yes, Twitter is short form content too, but it's very easy to share links, make threads, and post twitlongers, allowing the necessary context to be communicated during controversy. TikTok makes it much harder for people to even find a part two to your video, forcing viewers to manually go to your profile and find it from what's often a sea of other videos, which is an amount of effort that most people just aren't willing to put in. That means that you pretty much have 60 seconds to either communicate your entire point or convince viewers that hearing the rest of your story or point in a follow-up video is worth the extra step, which does effectively mean that TikTok is worse than Twitter in terms of one's ability to communicate all necessary information within the confines of short form content. So yes, both Twitter and TikTok are just as bad when it comes to enabling cancel culture, but Twitter at least allows for more accurate, in-depth information to be communicated, whereas TikTok practically encourages its users to spread misinformation during controversy because it doesn't give them time to explain the whole truth. It ends up very quickly deteriorating into a shitty game of telephone where the original claims weren't able to be substantiated or defined. So then they were spread by other 60 second videos with increasingly less and less accurate information as time passed. And the comparison to YouTube? Well, that comes down to the time limit too. Yes, YouTube is terrible with cancel culture. And when anyone does anything remotely controversial, you'll see 50 videos about it within 50 minutes of it coming to light. But if nothing else, those videos are usually at least 10 minutes long. And I'm not saying that means they're better because they're longer, but I am saying that to make a 10 minute video about a topic, you have to do a few things. You have to include the majority of the facts surrounding the topic, you have to do some research into what happened, and you have to spend a significant amount of time during the research, editing, and production process thinking about what happened. You have a large window of time where you have to contemplate whether or not you should be making that video, whether or not the side that you're taking is the right one, and whether or not you have all the facts. This adds an extra step for a lot of creators, like a roadblock between them and impulsively commenting on something they don't know enough about yet. And it's a roadblock that TikTok doesn't have. TikTok doesn't give you the time to present proof, and it certainly doesn't encourage you to. TikTok makes it so easy to just impulsively react to a controversial situation with your own 30 second take on it, which is often hateful or angry or uninformed, and it encourages others to do the same. So yes, cancel culture is just as prevalent on YouTube as it is on TikTok, but at the very least, YouTube places some modicum of importance on being informed first. TikTok doesn't seem to care much at all for it. Comparisons out of the way, we still haven't fully addressed why exactly TikTok is such a toxic environment. We've discussed why misinformation spreads so easily there, but we haven't tackled why people are so thoughtlessly and guiltlessly cruel there. And as I mentioned earlier, I believe that it's partially because of the focus on algorithm recommended content. What I mean is that despite the fact that TikTok is technically an entertainment platform, the majority of its users also see it as a social media platform, as a combination of both, where they can keep up with both their real life friends and their favorite creators. And it's the blurring of the line between the two that makes things complicated and potentially problematic. See, on most social media platforms, for the most part, you generally see posts from the people that you know and follow. Whether that's creators, family, or friends, what's promoted to you on your feed is based on 
either who you follow or the hashtags you follow. And based on that alone, there's a connection there. There's an innate understanding that you're interacting with real human beings, because more often than not, you followed them, so you understand, to some degree, that they are a real person. But TikTok isn't like that. The vast majority of users rely on its highly advanced algorithm to provide them with the content they're interested in on their For You page, which is only minorly influenced by who you follow, if at all. You can switch to your following page to see content from people you're actively seeking out and supporting, but the For You page is the default and the most popular way of engaging with content on TikTok by far. This means that when you're on TikTok, unlike most social media platforms, the majority of the content that you're seeing is from strangers. You're engaging with it like you would with normal social media, like you're talking to a friend or at least someone you know, but you're engaging with strangers, and you know you are. So immediately, whether you're aware of it or not, there's a disconnect there between yourself and that person that there wouldn't be on other platforms. You're not thinking of them as a human being, but simply as the creator of whatever you're looking at. And if who they are is automatically defined by the content that you're seeing in that moment, it's really easy to reduce them to just being that content. It's fundamentally dehumanizing. And if you don't see them as a person, it's really easy to insult, belittle, and mock them for their art. I mean, their art is all they are to you, so if you think it's bad, you think they're bad. And without knowing them or thinking of them as a person, why wouldn't you tell them so? It doesn't affect you. It doesn't even take a second thought when everyone else is doing it too. Especially on a platform where following trends and doing what everyone else is doing is the standard. It's so easy to be cruel, to mock and demean a real human being's art like doing so is harmless, to cancel an artist without proving that they did what they're being accused of, and so on, because you don't have any connection to them that forces you to see them as people. And on a platform where malicious and harmful trends are already considered commonplace, it's even more acceptable to spread hate without any real basis or justification for it. So we're left with an environment where beginner artists are constantly and relentlessly harassed and mocked. Artists of all levels are given unsolicited critique that more closely resembles bullying than constructive criticism, and artists are being cancelled over unsubstantiated claims. Now that we've established the primary issues from both the art and community sides of TikTok, let me give you an example of both sides combining to result in an unacceptable situation in which an artist was harassed and threatened to be doxxed over literally nothing beyond having an art style that people didn't like. As some of you who do use TikTok may know, Croquette is an artist who used to have an art style that put an emphasis on the eyes being very high on the character's face. Based on their Instagram, this is no longer the case, which may in large part be because of what they dealt with on TikTok, but we'll get into that. They posted a video on TikTok of their rendering process, which showed their piece go from sketch to colored and finished. This piece was particularly stylized, meaning that the character's eyes were even further up on the character's face than usual, and that was apparently all it took for TikTok's art community to completely demolish them. I'll show some comments on screen to give you guys an idea of what exactly they were facing in terms of backlash on their art style alone, but there were probably a lot more on their original post, which has since been deleted alongside their now privated account. Them privating their account was even something that people celebrated, because a great deal of TikTok users thought it was hilarious that this harassment managed to get them to leave the platform altogether. Before leaving, they even tried changing their bio to say that they weren't accepting critique to deter people from trying to leave their helpful input on their posts, which was received poorly. People just used that as another thing to mock, so they left, which was another win for them, apparently. Croquette was a prime example of both sides of the TikTok art community converging to ruin a person's life. On the art side, they faced the ridiculous and unfair scrutiny most beginner or amateur artists face on the platform, as if being anything less than professional and polished is a crime. They also dealt with unsolicited criticism and had their art fixed as a trend. On the community side, they saw the worst of unsubstantiated allegations being treated as fact. People hated them for making art they didn't like, and they hated them more when people decided to speak up and defend them for not deserving the hate they were receiving. So then claims arose that painted them in a worse light. Screenshots came out that they said the n-word, but they were completely cropped and edited with no actual proof that it was them in the screenshot saying it. Others claimed that they drew not safe for work of minor characters, despite them being a minor. And others claimed that they whitewashed their Cookie Run fan art because their depiction skin tone was like 10% lighter than canon in a different color palette than the canon depiction. None of this needed to be substantiated for the TikTok art community to start demonizing them for being a racist piece of garbage, which led to them being bullied off the platform a second time. Still, even now, if you look them up on TikTok, you'll see a plethora of videos just arguing about the technicalities of whether or not their Cookie Run fan art was whitewashing. Not whether or not it was right for this literal child to be bullied off the platform and face threats of doxing based on an unpopular art style and unsubstantiated claims. And that says a lot, because those videos weren't created with the intention of correcting an artist that they thought was whitewashing so that they could improve. The intention was to get them cancelled before they could ever draw again. Even if they had been deliberately whitewashing in the first place, which is more than debatable, they weren't told, here's what you did wrong and how you can do better. They were told, you're racist and you've messed up beyond repair and we see more value in pointing at you and laughing 
laughing than helping you change for the better. And that's one of the biggest, most insurmountable problems that I personally see in the TikTok community. And it's what happens when the art problems and the community problems coalesce. Ultimately, like I've said, it's not something we haven't seen with other art communities. It's something we still see now on YouTubes, certainly, and subsequently something I see myself all the time just by having my channel and using social media. It's just that the combination of all of the factors I discussed creates a unique environment on TikTok where all of the most toxic aspects of other platforms are nurtured and enabled to grow much, much worse. And I'm not saying that means you shouldn't use it or it's all bad. I can't stress enough that by discussing the bad parts of the platform, I do not at all mean to say that the whole platform is bad. I am, however, saying that if you do use TikTok and participate in the art community, number one, you're a much stronger, more patient person than I am. And number two, you should be careful to avoid participating in the dark sides of it too. Based on the huge focus on trends and the social disconnect between users and the artists they're viewing, it can seem harmless to jump on the bandwagon and start mocking and straight up bullying artists based on any and all flaws in their work. And I just think it's very important to try to remember that they're people too. And tearing them down is not helping them grow as artists, it's just tearing them down. I also think it's important to make sure you're questioning the accuracy and educational value of the tutorials on the platform, because taking those art hacks at face value can actually be really detrimental to your work. But so long as you're using TikTok cautiously and with its art community's flaws in mind, I'm sure you can have a completely positive, valuable experience there. I haven't, but again, you're probably a lot more patient and tolerant than I am. But that's really all I have to say about the TikTok art community. There are much, much worse aspects of TikTok as a whole, but that is fortunately a can of worms that other, more patient and qualified channels have already opened. So I'll link some of their videos in the description if it's something you're interested in learning about. But as far as this video is concerned, I'm finally done and you guys are finally free of my rambling. Thank you guys for watching and I hope you enjoyed today's video. Special thank you as always to channel members Cafe Soleil, Joseph Solomon, Unknown Code, Lucian Izapa, and Abyss Reborn, as well as patrons Batman, Kyle Lowe, Blue Swanson, This Is Totally My Name, Unity, Cora Fear, Jamisha Walker, Shirome Artiste, Elengshi, Soul Crystal, and Kim Yen for their support. And I'll see you in the next one.